meetings that came up that um, that I could not get away from. So I uh, just wanted to kind of touch base with you guys um, quickly this morning and give you an update on the outpatient COVID treatment, um, where we're at with that. Um, introduce myself real quickly. I'm Dr. Michael Broby. I'm an Associate Chief Medical Officer here at CAMC um, and really um, kind of headed up a lot of our outpatient COVID response in regards to monoclonal clinic. Um, and then our transition to oral therapies um, and our dive um, somewhat into remdesivir outpatient. We'll talk about that briefly too. So just kind of wanted to give you guys um, to start off kind of the idea of the agenda. We're going to kind of just look at the current state of affairs real quickly. Um, and then, you know, the three real treatment areas and, you know, we can kind of talk about the debate whether vaccines are a true treatment or not. But I think um, just want to touch base on, on the current recommendations for the vaccines, talk about antivirals and talk about monoclonals and honestly the limited role that, that monoclonals now have due to all the new variants. So this is data as of last week. You know, we had about 321 cases. Um, towards the end of the week, that number started going up. Um, and I think it will be important for us to monitor what those numbers look like um, across West Virginia in the next several weeks as the B2 has become the predominant variant in our communities. And um, we have seen some increased numbers um, across the country, um, but luckily hospitalizations have stayed um, fairly low with just slight rises. Um, and it looks like we'll probably be able to weather this. This will be nothing like an Omicron um, surge, um, but we may see a little bit of a surge coming in the next couple of weeks. Um, you can see at the beginning of last week, hospitalizations um, were at about 101. Um, across the state, and those um, hospitalizations have actually dropped down below 100 towards the end of um, this past week. Um, so continue to see hospitalizations. We've got our hospitalizations almost down um, as low as they were back in the summer of 2021, which was uh, one of our uh, low points. Um, so we're looking forward to, to continuing to see that increase. Um, I find this graph interesting just as a, a level set. You know, we go all the way back to May of um, 2020 um, on the far left, and you can kind of see, you know, as far as our employees off work, um, which near the um, community very well, um, and you can really see the impact of the vaccine, right? Um, you see after the first vaccine, we got a little bit of a dip, but then after we got that second vaccine in people, man, did we start seeing the numbers drop and got us into that summer wall that we had. Um, but then the Delta variant came and then quickly followed by the Omicron variant. And now um, we're back down in another wall like we were in the summer of 2021. So I think as we begin to talk about, you know, vaccines, antivirals, and monoclonal therapy, um, it's important to look at um, just kind of level set the, the differences. So, you know, when you're talking about antibody therapy or monoclonal therapy, you're actually injecting, you know, a protein that binds to the viruses and, and basically stops it from infecting you. Um, it basically causes the virus to be ineffective. The thing to remember, though, is that there is kind of this convergence point where if you have too high of a viral load, you can't put enough proteins in or monoclonal antibodies in um, to block that. And that's why there's time sensitivity to getting monoclonals in. We do use the antibody therapy that are already infected. We want to give it as soon as we can. And it protects you. Um, for weeks to months, um, some of the Evusel, which is the prophylactic monoclonal, um, it's looking like it will protect you about six months. When we talk about vaccines, um, you know, basically it's a piece of the virus. The body kind of um, responds to that. It's for people that are not actively um, sick with COVID. Usually it takes one to two weeks um, after um, you receive the dose um, before it becomes effective. Um, and you know, I think years to lifetime, but as we've seen, you definitely need boosters. So what I wanted to look at first was just to discuss um, basically the, the three vaccines that are on the American market. Um, you have the Pfizer vaccine, which is a messenger RNA. Um, it does go from um, ages um, five through 11 and then 12 and older. Um, Moderna has been approved 18 and older, and then Johnson & Johnson 18 and older. You can see a slight change in dosages um, for the pediatric dosages, and actually they're different um, vaccines. So um, the 5 to 11-year-old vaccine um, actually has an orange cap on it, 
Um, and then the 12 years um, and up, um, depending on the concentration of it, either has a purple cap or a gray cap, um, depending on whether it needs to be constituted or not. And then, of course, the Moderna and Johnson and Johnson are just, um, are just one um, dosage type. We look at the primary series, um, you know, the messenger RNAs are two doses, and the Johnson and Johnson is one. Um, both of the messenger RNA vaccines have been approved for a third primary dose um, for those that are severely or moderately immunocompromised. Um, Johnson and Johnson did not get that indication. Um, and then for boosters, um, below the age of 12, boosters have not been approved of any type, um, only the two primary doses or a third primary dose if that child is immunocompromised. Um, 12 and older has been approved for one booster. And then um, here recently, I, I've made a little footnote that the second booster has also been approved for those um, um, elderly um, populations as well. So this kind of helps us um, you know, see that, that footnote when we talk about people over the age of 50 and older. This kind of gives you a little bit different view. Um, so everybody you know, on day zero would get their first um, injection. Um, you can see that the Pfizer um, for ages five to 11 is three weeks after the first. Um, but now for ages um, 12 and older, um, they've kind of bumped that out to three to eight. And actually probably most of um, the experts recommend that you wait about two months after your first to receive your second dose if you have not received that already. Um, same with Moderna. Um, and then the Johnson & Johnson booster um, is, uh, you know, of course, the first booster of those has to be given at the two-month mark. Now, it is um, noted that it, um, you can interchange these vaccines now, and um, a lot of people recommend that if you got a Johnson & Johnson for your first one, that perhaps your booster is actually a messenger RNA. And then you can see at the five months um, after the second dose, it's recommended that you get a Pfizer booster if you're over the age of 12. If you're over the age of 18 with Moderna, it's also five months after your second dose. And now, if you look down in the age in the um, um, in the uh, footnotes, there it talks about uh, people ages 15 and older may choose to receive a second booster if it's been at least four months after their first booster. So that's what that line over on the on the far right is. Um, and this again, this is for people that are not moderately or severely immunocompromised. Because remember, those patients receive a third primary dose. And you can see that here. Um, so with the Pfizer vaccine, there's that third primary dose. Then you would start the two booster series um, if they were over the age of 50. Um, I'll be sharing these slides um, with you guys. Um, so you will have these for you. Um, but I always recommend, uh, particularly with all the changes that we've seen recently, um, to really stay up to date with the CDC. Um, they're kind of our guiding light um, in regards to what we need to do in regards to vaccinations um, moving forward. Um, so really keep an eye on the CDC, uh, keep your ears to the ground as, as this has been a quite fluid activity over the last several years. Um, but I think we've kind of got ourselves in a little bit of a, of a pattern here of, of what we'll be doing. You know, the biggest question that comes up is whether there will be a um, seasonal um, type shot. Um, and a lot of people think they will. Um, and we also feel like there'll probably be some updates um, to the vaccine in regards to the variants that are now um, available. And it's possible that um, you may see something in a pattern very similar to the flu shot moving forward. So again, only the Pfizer is for ages 5 to 17. Um, these are just some kind of general rules. Um, in general, the messenger RNA vaccine should be used for primary series. Really, the Johnson & Johnson has kind of lost a lot of its um, shining light. I think the big thing with Johnson & Johnson at first was that it's just one shot and done. Um, however, we have found that that is definitely not the case. Um, you do need boosters with it, and that in those cases, um, we do see some stronger efficacy with the messenger RNA vaccines. Um, as I mentioned, you can interchange them. So um, um, any vaccine can be used for boosters. Um, for those of you that were involved when the vaccine initially came out, um, because it was EUA and there weren't a lot of um, uh, studies or case studies um, in, in regards to its interaction with other vaccines, 
we were very protective of a time period around the COVID vaccine that you could not have other vaccines. That has since been lifted and you can actually receive the COVID vaccine at the same time you do a flu or pneumonia or tetanus. There's no other um, contraindications with other vaccines now. Um, so that's really good to know. Um, for those that are on any type of immunosuppressive therapies, um, the vaccine should be given two weeks prior to starting or resuming the immunosuppressive therapy. So you want to give the vaccine two weeks without the immunosuppressive therapies um, to really kick in. And that's pretty much a general rule of any vaccine. Um, and vaccines can be given in inter any interval after COVID and passive antibody therapies. When this initially came out, one of the things that we talked a lot about was waiting 90 days after receiving monoclonal therapy um, before you could um, receive your vaccine. And that's no longer the case. Um, we, um, they are now approved to be given after any interval after COVID. Um, so if you have COVID and someone decides they want to get the vaccines now, um, really the only indication is that they wait until they're out of quarantine. Um, but other than that, they can get the um, vaccine um, um, really at any time. So um, as we kind of move from vaccines, you know, again, this is, I mentioned, really keep your eye on the, on the CDC website as things do change. Um, I would not use this slide deck as, as my Bible of therapy. Um, and again, um, the same thing goes when we start talking about outpatient therapies, um, including antivirals and monoclonal therapy. Um, so I kind of even made a note here that this is the NIH um, statement on treatment as of April 9th. Um, I checked prior to, um, to recording this presentation and there have been no significant changes from the 9th. Um, but I also gave a link um, down at the bottom of the slide um, for the actual guidelines. Um, and I recommend that you guys use those as, as something you check back on. Uh, one thing we've done here at Charleston Area Medical Center is now instead of having um, treatment protocols or treatment guidelines linked on our COVID, um, you know, internal website. Um, we now have a link to the NIH for both inpatient and outpatient treatments. Um, so I think that's probably the best way to go. Um, as most of us are busy clinicians, um, you know, it's hard for us to kind of um, keep up to date on keeping websites updated. And it's probably just easier to have a link to the NIH, which is going to be keeping these, these updated. So as many of you guys who are clinicians know, uh, initially the struggle was real with COVID at the beginning. We really had zero outpatient therapies. Um, and then we um, did have monoclonals, um, which was a logistical um, hurdle to overcome um, outpatient infusions on um, fairly contagious people um, where you couldn't do them in your regular infusion centers. Um, but now we've been able to move towards um, antivirals. So I think it's important that still though, um, the NIH only recommends treatment for those that are at high risk of progressing to, COVID, to severe COVID-19. Um, so if you have a fairly healthy individual um, that does not um, have any risk factors, uh, they're probably better off um, just riding the COVID out. Um, if they do have risk factors, such as obesity, diabetes, sleep apnea, COPD, asthma, any of those things that would cause them to be at a much higher risk for COVID, um, for severe COVID, which could lead to hospitalizations. Um, and then again, particularly those that are unvaccinated. Um, that's when you want to, in your mind, consider some type of treatment. Um, so the NIH currently um, prefers two treatments. They prefer the oral agent, um, Paxlovid, um, which is the Pfizer product, which is made up of two antivirals. Um, they recommend that as first line, as well as Randesivir. Now, you may be thinking outpatient remdesivir. Um, so they have approved remdesivir for outpatient treatment. It is still IV and still requires three days. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Most facilities are not able to handle doing remdesivir that way. Um, I know in Huntington, they did it a little bit. We were ramping up to do it at CAMC, but this is, we were getting ready to push it out. Um, Paxlovid became much more available and our um, overall COVID numbers began to drop. Um, so we put that on hold. You are um, recommended for use only when neither of the preferred therapies are available, feasible to use or clinically appropriate. So, um, you know, availability, um, Paxlovid is getting more available, but still is limited to which pharmacies and different things to carry it. 
feasibility to use, I think that's in line with when I guess here the three days of IV therapy or clinically inappropriate. We'll talk about a lot of the interactions that Paxlovid has. Um, they're not um, insurmountable. Um, they're, as long as you know um, what they are and you review them, um, Paxlovid um, can be a very safe medication to prescribe. But in those cases for use only when neither of the preferred therapies are available, um, they do recommend um, the telovimab, which is um, the only monoclonal right now that is um, sensitive to uh, B2. And then you have um, molybdenum, and I, I kind of butchered that one a little bit. That's the Merck antiviral. Um, and you notice that the, the panel recommends against the use of dexamethasone or other systemic steroids in the absence of another indication. And I think, you know, as we've seen people um, over the year um, receive uh, monoclonals and re re review their medications, I think it's important to realize, you know, that um, really since the beginning, dexamethasone or other systemic um, steroids have been contraindicated in the outpatient setting where oxygen is not required. Um, so if you require a supplemental oxygen, um, then perhaps that's a little bit of a different story in regards to corticosteroids. But then also, um, if they do have underlying C COPD or asthma, which is um, exacerbated by uh, COVID and they're wheezing and have other signs of inflammation, um, then those may be a, another indication as mentioned in the guidelines. So let's talk about Paxlovid first. As I said, it's one of two agents that are um, recommended as first line agents. Um, it must be done within five days of symptoms. So you have a little bit of uh, a timetable there, um, a little tighter than the timetable for monoclonals were. Um, so you have five days of symptoms onset. It's only available for 12 years or older. There is a renal adjustment with gratin clearance. Um, basically what happens is they take one of the antivirals, um, it comes in a pack, um, and the pharmacist ends up popping one of the antivirals out of the pack. Um, but there is a renal adjustment, so you just need to make sure you understand what that is. And probably the most significant interaction is with the CYP3A um, pathway. Um, and of course, um, you know, for clearance and for which elevated concentrations are associated with serious or life-threatening um, reactions. So, you know, just quickly, um, you know, these medications need that CYP3A needed for clearance. Um, so you may get elevated levels of these medications. Um, alpha-1, um, adrenoreceptor uh, antagonist, analgesics, um, anti-arrhythmic um, medications, colchicine, um, antipsychotics like clozapine or clozapine, um, you know, and the other list of, of, of medications here. I think it's just important, um, you know, um, we've got um, Viagra there when used for pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, so, it's important to familiarize yourself with, with the medications from, um, that go through the CYP3A. You know, you also have the inducers, which could cause issues reversely. Um, you know, St. John's wards, uh, phenobarbital or fanfan. Um, so just kind of keep those in mind as well. Um, you know, I, I, I would recommend if you go to the link for uh, the guidelines, that they also have a specific link that will take you to the Paxlovid um, EUA. Um, and you can review a full list of those medications there. Um, so besides renal um, function, as well as um, consideration of other medications, um, you know, Paxlovid has shown um, to be fairly effective um, in reducing um, almost by 86 to 90 percent risk of hospitalization. Um, and then um, endpoint um, that was not monitored was um, mortality after 28 days. Um, and if the um, treatment group, that was zero. Um, so definitely um, seems very effective and uh, hence the reason the NIH has placed that as the number one um, indication for patient stats are considered high risk for severe COVID or hospitalization. Remember, there were two medications. Um, so the other medication was remdesivir. Remdesivir is IV only. Um, again, it's only for 12 years or older. Um, it's a three-day course where you see 200 milligrams IV on day one and 100 milligrams on day two and three. As I mentioned, it's really a logistic, logistical nightmare. You have to have labs prior to treatment. 
getting someone with COVID transported somewhere three days in a row um, is, is really difficult. Um, and then the, the thing to remember is that Ramdesivir also uh, can be used on inpatients with de dexamethasone for five days if the O2 is required. And I just um, put that there um, because some people may be admitted to the hospital and are placed on Ramdesivir. Um, and the thing about continuing Ramdesivir as an outpatient is that if they've been hospitalized um, and they're well enough to go home, they do not need to continue Ramdesivir once discharged. Um, we used to think that once you started Ramdesivir, you had to remain in the hospital for the full five days. Um, I myself um, had COVID in uh, November of 2020 uh, before vaccines, um, and I had to remain in the hospital for um, five days as I received my Ramdesivir, even though um, back in the day I received uh, colonialism and plasma as well in that first day, and then my first dose of Ramdesivir, I actually improved greatly after the first 24 hours. Um, so nowadays, I probably wouldn't have been able to go home, but back in October 2020, um, we kept patients there to receive the full five days of Ramdesivir. So if neither Paxlovid is available or there's the feasibility of receiving Ramdesivir as an outpatient, um, the monoclonal of its map is available. Um, it's the only monoclonal available when B2 is greater than 50%. And to be honest, B2 is greater than 50% in um, well over 90% of the country, if not higher. Um, so it's really, unfortunately, the only monoclonal we have. Um, so we've really kind of lined down our availability. I know the CMC, we actually handed off um, the outpatient monoclonal um, therapy to the local health department and now does it there. Um, again, this one is only for eight to 12 and up, um, and it must be before seven days of symptoms. And this is just to kind of give you guys again, to kind of explain a little bit when I talk about vaccines and um, you know antibody treatment. But I think this picture is is really helpful. So in the top right, you can see how the COVID vaccine just plops right into a human cell. Um, but then what happens is the little blue monoclonal antibodies get pushed around. They attach to the spike protein on the COVID, um, and then they basically do not allow that spike protein to fit into the receptors of the human cells, which then in turn makes it inactive. But the thing to remember is if your viral load is too high, if you can't overcome with the amount of antibodies that you're injecting, overcome the number of viruses that are floating around, hence the reason for the seven days. It's found that after seven days, monoclonal therapy is, is not effective. All right, and then let's finally talk about um, the final oral agent that is in that kind of tier two. Um, uh, but seems to work fairly well. So basically what happens is you drop from that 90% to 100% effectiveness down to about 80 to 90%. So it hence the reason why it's a second line, um, but still works fairly well. Um, you know, particularly if you don't have the option of IV grant desivir and then um, you don't have the availability of the monoclonals, the second line agents um, when Paxlovid or grant desivir is not available. You cannot use monoclonal in pregnancy, um, but it's not a complete contraindication. Um, it, it's just kind of a high risk, um, and you can't have a risk um, discussion with a patient. But you know, in my feeling, most um, pregnant women, unless they have severe, severe diseases of other types, are probably not going to be um, extremely high risk for severe COVID at this point. Hopefully, most are vaccinated and those types of things. Um, but it would really have to be a, a strong reason that you couldn't get a hold of a monoclonal um, or something else um, before I would prescribe it to um, a, a pregnant woman, um, which then brings up the question of whether you should have them do a pregnancy test before starting the medication, um, which I know some clinicians have been able to do that. Um, and the other thing is that it's available for 18 years um, and older. So let's talk a little bit about some of the medications that we've talked about over the last couple of years, just to kind of clear some confusion about those as well. Um, so we've talked about dexamethasone a lot. It's not recommended by the NIH panel for mild to moderate CO, um, to COVID, the mild to moderate COVID. So, you know, it's probably not appropriate to prescribe de dexamethasone in the outpatient setting unless um, it, they're requiring either an increase in their oxygen or being placed on on oxygen. Um, so if, if you're noticing, you know, those types of things, dexamethasone likely plays a role in that. 
but in mild to moderate COVID, um, we really don't want to be using dexamethasone at this point. We also have a list of medications that hopefully enough um, studies have been put out there to kind of shy away from using those medications. Um, so, you know, obviously the, the first medication is the hydroxychloroquine. Um, multiple, multiple, multiple studies have found that it's not effective against COVID. Um, ivermectin, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, one or two weeks ago, um, had a huge study that they published. Ivermectin is not indicated for the use of, of COVID. Um, antibiotics um, seems pretty straightforward, um, but I think, unfortunately, like uh, many other viral infections, a lot of times um, ZPAC or other antibiotics are prescribed. There's really no indication for antibiotics. And probably one of the more interesting um, things that have kind of come around from time to time with COVID due to its um, what seems to be hypercoagulable state that it creates is whether anticoagulants should be prescribed or used, whether either an aspirin or some type of platelet um, medication or, or whether it's true like NOAC or something. Um, and really the studies do not show that, that in a typical outpatient setting that there's any reason to um, prescribe aspirin or Plavix or, or, or NOAC or um, any type of um, anticoagulant. Um, the studies just don't show any um, overall benefit from that. Now, of course, um, on the inpatient setting, you know, obviously you're going to do DVT prophylaxis um, likely anyways with these patients. Um, so in those cases, anticoagulation will be appropriate. Um, but again, this lecture was focused on, on outpatient. Um, you know, when we first started COVID, um, I remember one of the first things we all um, were kind of concerned about was, you know, were there certain medications that we needed to stop? Um, you do not need to stop ACE inhibitors. Um, that was a, a thing that came up early on in COVID. Um, the NIH um, in their guidelines actually state, you know, again, do not need to stop ACEs. You do not need to start stop statins. You do not need to stop NSAIDs. And they also document that you do not need to stop steroids. So as we mentioned, you know, not needing to use dexamethasone, but if they're already on a steroid, you don't necessarily need to stop the steroid. Um, moving forward. So um, I know with the recorded lecture, it's probably or impossible to ask me any questions. And again, I, I completely apologize uh, for not being able to be there this morning um, to talk with you guys. Um, it's, it's unfortunately um, was beyond my control. Um, but I, um, I am open to, to any questions via email. Um, if you want to um, send me an email, we can also um, chat on the phone. Um, I have shared with you the links to the NIH guidelines, which I think have pretty much become kind of the Bible of both inpatient and outpatient um, treatments. So I recommend that you guys um, um, take a look at that as well. Um, so I think that concludes this part of your lecture, and I hope you guys um, enjoy your, your case um, study discussions. Um, so thank you guys um, so, um, so very much. Thank you. Alrighty, so for those of you who uh, hopped on here a little after we got started, as you heard Dr. Roby mention, um, he was unable to attend live today, so he kindly uh, pre-recorded his uh, didactic for us. So um, I see we have two comments in the chat here. Um, so yes, Dr. Roby is from CAMC, so um, I'll definitely be uh, attaching his uh, PowerPoint in the recap email. We're still going to be uploading the YouTube video as well, so you'll be able to see his actual presentation um, as you did just now. Um, but were there any questions? As you mentioned, I can still email him any questions that come through, and I'll be sure to distribute it out to everyone as well. So. Uh, we'll just open it up for anyone with any comments, questions. Feel free to unmute or chat in. No pressure at all. <laughs> Sometimes some folks have questions after the fact, like after the session's finished as well. So feel free, you can email Elizabeth or myself at any point. So. I guess I'd just make one comment. Um, I don't know, the jury's probably still out, but you know, one interesting thing that's, you know, we've been discussing is there was a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that was like beginning of February or maybe the end of January looking at um, 
you know, diff getting as a booster one of the, you know, something different than what's your primary series. Um, and it seemed like the antibody response was more robust. So if you say had Moderna for your primary series and then you got Pfizer for your booster, your antibody response did seem maybe a little higher. Um, now, I don't know if that's actually translated into better protection or not um, from severe illness or hospitalizations, but um, sort of just an interesting find. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. I, I heard that too, and I wasn't quite sure. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, does anyone have any comments to that? Or maybe anyone else heard something along those lines? Well, I can uh, let Dr. Roby know. Dr. Stanford, yes. Yeah, I'll make one other, you know, point is, you know, another thing we've been talking about is just how sort of infectious this new Omicron is. I mean, thankfully, it doesn't seem to cause severe illness, but you know, we were looking at partnering with the CDC and American Thoracic Society on a little implementation study how to, um, you know, impact people who don't believe in vaccines and how, you know, what are ways you could potentially address that issue. Um, but the way this, you know, new variant is, one thing that came up is, I mean, it doesn't even seem like masks really do anything. I mean, you literally have to be in like a level five bio suit almost to have any protection against this new variant. So is everyone going to have some degree of natural immunity just the way this new uh, variant sort of rips through the community? Just another point I'd send out there. Yeah, that's funny. Can you imagine everyone wearing hazmat suits and just walking around or something? But, I mean, Dr. Stansbury, did you hear anything about like, is it effective to be socially distanced, like how we've been told, or it's also unknown with this new one? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's really known. I think the data is from this like one. Um, Israeli study maybe, but just kind of the standard practice is the way this virus is transmitted. I mean, it's almost impossible not to get it essentially. Um, again, thankfully, it doesn't seem to, um, you know, cause severe illness like Delta, uh, particularly in otherwise healthy patients, but it, it'll be sort of a sort of interesting. And when you look at sort of the natural history of diseases, you know, diseases that cause sort of a, or viruses that cause a high mortality tend to sort of burn themselves out. So that's actually not good for the virus, you know, evolutionarily speaking. So, you know, the way viruses tend to evolve, they want to cause less severe disease and just kind of become endemic in a population. So hopefully that's the way, you know, COVID, um, continues to um, evolve over time, but you know, we will see. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Yes, we will see. <laughs> Any final comments, thoughts, questions from the group? Alrighty, well, thank you all so much for joining today. Uh, my only announcement is that our next session will be on May 2nd. I can't believe it's already May soon. Um, and Dr. Silo will be presenting on chest x-rays. So thank you all so much. And we hope to see you next time. Take care, everyone. Thank you.